The video you're about to watch will definitely serve to separate members of the younger crowd from those of the older crowd in the viewing audience. Hello there everyone, you've tuned in UXW Bill, and for this particular video I'm going to take a very special opportunity to make my initial foray into the exciting subject of oddware and related videos. Oddware, in case you happen to be unfamiliar with the term, refers to the discussion and preservation of the history surrounding unusual computer hardware, software, and peripheral devices. It's my understanding that the oddware term, at least here on YouTube, was coined by YouTube user Lazy Game Review, although theirs is not a channel that I happen to follow. However, a channel that I do follow and have followed almost since I started my career here on YouTube is that of V Westlife, and he has done several videos discussing the subject of oddware in the past. One of the most notable videos that he did concerning oddware, at least to my mind, concerned the discussion of a computer mouse that also served as a telephone. You could use it not only to receive, but also to place voice telephone calls. When I got the idea to perhaps consider making my own oddware videos, I thought that I would go big or go home and do something like discussing, oh, the NEC PowerMate Eco computer that I have been promising to make a video about for, oh, approximately since the beginning of time or thereabouts. But since that's a ways off yet, although I promise you it will most definitely happen, I have decided to break you all in a bit more gently. Now, those of you in the viewing audience who are older or have been working with computer equipment for a long period of time will undoubtedly know what the items here in the middle of the video frame are. But for younger members of the audience who may never have seen these devices, these are external telephone modems for use with personal computers and similar equipment. I say similar equipment because many times you could connect these to just about anything that could manage any kind of serial communication so long as you had the right cable. Once you had connected this to whatever you had in mind to use with it, you could then exchange information with, say, the Internet through a dial-up Internet service provider, through something such as a bulletin board system where multiple users would dial in with their modems, exchange programs, sometimes pirated, uh, send text messages to one another, uh, predecessor to email, things like that. But for most people, these were a means to get on the Internet over the period of the past 20 years. But you don't see them used for that very often any longer because in most parts of the world, almost everyone has been fortunate enough to be switched over to broadband. There are still a small segment of users for which a dial-up modem working over the telephone lines is their only realistic option to get to the Internet. And unfortunately, this places them in a very bad situation because most of today's Internet and the World Wide Web are not at all conducive to being used over such slow connections as dial-up access to the Internet would happen to provide. But these things do have other uses as well. They are sometimes used as part of security, paging, or alerting systems in the event that another form of connection, such as an internet connection, should go down. These may be used in conjunction with devices that are known as out-of-band management or alerting systems. Sometimes these devices are found installed in uninterruptible power supplies, servers with integrated lights-out management. It's also possible to use these things if for some reason you wanted to control a computer but wish to do so over a more private channel than the the public internet. You could install remote access software on a computer such as Symantec's venerable PC Anywhere package and you could dial a telephone number at which point you would be connected to the computer and able to control its desktop or send commands to it via the command line interface. So although dial-up modems such as these two have definitely paled in importance they certainly do still have their uses, and some of them, such as the two shown here, are actually capable not of just exchanging data with other computers, but also operating as very expensive fax machines for both send and receive purposes. And although we have a lot of technology in this day and age that has supplanted the lowly fax machine, it is something you will still find in almost any business, mailbox store, document reproduction uh, house, uh, even places such as grocery stores sometimes still have a fax machine, and sometimes they even let their customers use it. All of that, however, is merely academic, 
it's high time we talked about the actual oddware that is the subject of this particular video. So I'll go ahead and push those other two modems off to the side, and then I will tell you all about this. This is the Popcom Model X100 Portable Modem. It was manufactured around the year 1984 by the Prentice Corporation. I'm practically certain they are out of business at this particular point. But when they were an ongoing concern, they were located at 266 Caspian Drive in Sunnyvale, California. And when this thing was brand new in 1984 or thereabouts, well, it must have really been something, because in addition to being able to exchange information at the pretty quick rate of 1,200 bits per second, it also had the advantage of being almost completely self-contained and very, very easy to set up. When I was showing you these other modems just a moment ago, you may have noticed that they do not contain everything you need to establish a connection to some other resource. You would have to plug a telephone line into them. You could, on, you could optionally plug in a telephone handset if you had a desire to do so. But you would also need a serial cable and, most importantly, an external power supply to successfully use either one of these two modems. While this modem certainly does not do away with the connection to the computer, or the need to plug it into a telephone line, and it does, rather surprisingly, have the capability of accepting an extension phone, it builds in the power supply and almost everything else you need. Now, for those of you who are old hands with modems, you will no doubt have noticed that there really isn't much of anything as concerns status of operation on this particular modem. For those of you who are less familiar, the external modems that were commonplace back in the day, I think you can even still buy them to this day, featured a great number of status LEDs that indicated what the modem was doing at any particular time. For example, if the carrier had been detected, if the modem was off hook, if it was receiving or sending a fax in the case of this U.S. robotics unit. You don't get any of that with this Popcom modem, but what you do get are audible tones that serve to indicate whether or not it has been correctly hooked up. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at some of the controls that you get with this thing and the input and output connections. Right here is a connection to a standard RJ11, at least here in the United States, telephone jack. In the middle we have a 25-pin RS-232 compatible serial connection, of which more in just a moment. And then we have a connection for an optional extension phone if you decide that you wish to use them use one with this particular modem. Now I kind of question their decision to include such a thing because I really cannot imagine that it was a huge selling point for most people, especially given the portable nature of this modem. While they certainly may have been displacing a conventional wired telephone to use it, I can't imagine that anyone would have had a great desire to plug in a conventional telephone handset to this particular modem. This was not the only way to use a modem on the go to exchange data with other computers bulletin board systems, and the like. You could actually get other devices such as acoustic couplers that actually attach themselves to telephone handsets and then would go in turn to connect to either your computer or your data terminal equipment such as a teletype or some other form of dumb terminal along the way. But those things are besides the point of this discussion. In addition to all of this information on the back, which you can pause the video to read if you should desire to do so. This is very hard to read. It may not survive the compression and encoding process. I really don't know. But there's also a volume control on the back. Now a lot of late model internal and even some external modems no longer have a speaker on board, or if they do, it's of such crude and poor fidelity that you can't really tell what the modem is doing in any great detail. But back when this thing was manufactured, you could tell a lot from a modem handshake. You can today if you decide to break it down and analyze it yourself. But you could adjust the volume of the speaker, and if you decided that you didn't need to have it at all, I'm sure that this potentiometer control on the back of the unit has sufficient range to actually mute the speaker. One thing that is rather surprising for a portable modem such as this, it is designed only for 110, 120 volt operations. So you couldn't very well take this thing to a country where higher or lower line voltage, such as 220, 240 volts, or the 100 volts that's commonplace in Japan, would be found instead of the nominal 110, 120. That's the standard here in the United States and some other places. You could always use a step-down transformer with this thing, but it would be just one more thing to carry. 
Speaking of this particular modem and carrying things, it was designed originally to be utilized with portable, or dare I say, luggable computers that were all the rage back in the mid to early and late 1980s before the first true laptops came along. This particular page that you're looking at right now is a review from the July 23rd, 1984 issue of InfoWorld Magazine. It is brought to us by way of Google Books. I will be sure to link this in the video description if you want to read more about it. But this is a review of the modem back in the uh, time when it would have been new. It talks about some of the things that were very important standards at the time, the transmit and recep reception speeds for data exchange, and all sorts of things, including the importance of what they called haze compatibility. Again, for those of you who are old hands in the computer industry or have been around for a while, you'll undoubtedly know what that is. For younger members of the viewing audience who, again, can read more about this online because it is a little bit out of the... Uh, out of the relevance center of this particular video. Hayes compatibility refers to the command set that is utilized by a particular modem to tell it to do things like pick up the telephone line or hang up, dial a certain number, return information about itself, and almost every modem today, even the ones you still buy now, are nominally compatible with the Hayes command set even if they are a Win modem only and have to be operated from within an environment such as Microsoft Windows or even the few Win modems that have support under something such as the GNU Linux operating system. Of course, in preparing to make this video, I came across a very good question that I somehow had to find an answer to. It used to be that back in the day when modems were popular, there was no shortage of things you could dial into with them. Bulletin board systems, internet service providers, all manner of stuff. Even other people's computers, if you knew them and wanted to set up a uh, means of communication, you could use each of your telephone lines and set your modems to talk to one another, and you could exchange information for as long as you cared to do so, or until one of you got disconnected. <laughs> but unfortunately today, all that sort of thing has by and large disappeared with the exception of dial-up internet service providers, of which there are certainly still a few. Unfortunately, I don't subscribe to any, and the free ones, such as NetZero, require, to the best of my knowledge, that you download some sort of software on your computer. But any video about a modem such as this wouldn't be complete without some kind of a demonstration. And finally it occurred to me, the perfect demonstration, at least for users here in the United States, was sitting right underneath my nose. It may be common knowledge to some of you that the National Institute of Standards and Technology here in the United States of America operates not only an, an atomic clock that keeps a very precise source of time, but it also provides the output of that atomic clock over several different means. The internet, shortwave radio, conventional voice telephone, and you guessed it, dial-up modem as well. Yes, it is possible to dial a telephone number at your own long-distance calling expense and receive the time data, less any delays, shipping and gouging, directly from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. If you do not live in the United States, your home country may have a similar service. I certainly do not recommend calling the United States unless you want to receive a particularly shocking telephone bill or something along those lines. And it may not work over something like voice over IP, but I really couldn't speak very intelligently about that. So, with something to go ahead and call into, it's time we hook up this modem, and as we hook it up, we will see some of its features very plainly demonstrated, one of which makes it very, very easy to know that you have connected this unit properly, despite the fact that it does not have any obvious indicator lights. Not even a power indicator light. There isn't even something that shines inside it to the best of my ability. Now this particular modem is made to plug directly into a wall outlet. This power adapter does not detach or come away from the unit unless of course you break it, which I certainly don't recommend or plan to do. So you've got to be able to have an outlet that you can plug it into. Fortunately here in the computer mess room I most certainly do. So we'll go ahead and plug it in the outlet just as soon as I've made a few other preparations. And while I may sound like a broken record at this point for saying so, this is just another one of those things that makes a real computer with actual legacy ports so very, very useful. 
to this day it can still communicate perfectly even with a very legacy piece of hardware such as this. Now when I plug this unit in, in order to indicate that it has been connected properly, it will emit a series of tones. There are three different tones according to InfoWorld magazine that this thing can emit, and it will emit two of them when I plug it in because I have hooked up not only the computer data cable, but I will also have connected it to AC power. Ideally, I suspect that you were meant to plug this into AC power first, and then contravening the convention, especially with older computers, I suspect that then you were intended to hook up the data cabling to your computer. At least that's how InfoWorld put it back in the day. So listen very carefully and you'll hear this thing make several rapid-fire touch tone sounds to indicate that the first of two connections have been made. There's the first two sets of touch, to touch tones. Now all I have to do is find the other end of the telephone cable here, plug that into my phone jack, and the modem will sense that, and it will emit another series of touch tones. To indicate now that everything should, at least in theory, be ready to go. So let's see if that's true by calling the National Institute of Standards and Technology and asking them what time it is. Here, briefly, are some interesting facts concerning the NIST's Automated Computer Time Service System. They say that the system located in Colorado has eight phone lines and, if you can believe it, receives an average of about 2,000 telephone calls per day. I don't know when that figure was last updated. I would also be curious to know as to how many of those calls are actually made by people who are looking to receive time information on their personal computer. I suppose it is entirely possible that various automated devices, such as, again, management cards, security systems, and similar things that have telephone line but not internet-facing connections, could be calling in to make sure that their real-time clocks are set. They also have a number that can be called if you happen to live in Hawaii, where due to the greatly reduced population, of course, they have two phone lines and receive about 100 calls per day. With all of that said, I've made all the preparations necessary to place the call. So let's go ahead and cut down on some of the noise here. This will make the network mad at me. And it did. <laughs> but now hopefully you'll be able to hear this modem dial out a lot more clearly than you could have with all the racket from that old SMC Easy switch over there on the other side of the desk. Windows XP does not have a built-in driver for this modem, but once again, that is the glory of standards such as the previously mentioned Hayes command set. So let's see what happens when we call and ask for the time. Their connection has been achieved, with the handshake having been performed. We might need to send a few characters to convince them that we mean business, but apparently not, because here comes the time, folks. The Julian date, the conventional year-month date, and then the time itself in universal coordinated time. And they say that we will automatically be disconnected within two minutes. But there's no need to wait even that long, because I now have all the information that I needed. And that means I can take my modem down and put it away for now. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. As always, it is certainly very much appreciated, especially when you have to put up with my tendency to ramble quite badly, as I did during segments of this particular video. As always, please feel free to leave a video comment if you happen to have one. I look forward to hearing from you, but now it's time for me to edit and upload this video, though most definitely not over a 1200 bit per second modem link.